Exploring the Bizarre. bizarre. Your e-ticket ride into the world of the paranormal. Strap yourself in as we traverse the universe exploring the unexplained. UFOs, UFOs, UFOs ghosts, ghosts, lost worlds, lost worlds cryptozoology, cryptozoology, as well as other dimensions. dimensions. It's time to take back the night. Back the night. Back. Now, your electrifying hosts of Exploring the Bazaar, Timothy Beckley and Tim Swartz. Ah, that's right. Here we are once again for another wondrous episode of Exploring the Bazaar, heard right here on the great KCOR Digital Radio Network. Well, I'm Tim Swartz, and uh, we're still uh, still waiting to uh, to get Tim Beckley on the line. I think uh, I think maybe the Men in Black have uh, have taken him away for a while, so. Hopefully they'll release him and uh, and then he'll be able to join us. But uh, tonight I'll just uh, I'll just go right into uh, uh, bringing our guest in. Uh, tonight we have uh, a really uh, excellent program. We have with us uh, uh, Brent Rains and Thomas Workman, and we're going to talk about uh, just uh, all sorts of interesting things. So uh, Brent, Tom, it's uh, it's great to have you with us tonight. Oh, it's, oh, it's great to be here. <laughs> uh, fantastic well uh now uh uh, uh brent uh, now we've talked uh, we've talked before on uh on, on on other programs and um i'll just uh, i'll give you a i'll give you a, a a brief introduction to our audience and uh so brent rains has been investigating and researching ufos since 1967 and he's the author of visitors from the hidden realm and editor of alternative perceptions magazine which you can uh, uh, uh that used to be a uh, an actually a, a published uh, magazine didn't it brent uh yes it did it um it was a newsstand i mean we had distributors you know uh throughout the united states and up into canada but uh um, you know, things uh, change in the publishing industry, uh, and uh, we had to go internet. And actually, that's a good deal for uh, readers because it's free and it comes out more frequently. It used to be uh, every three months, and now it's uh, every month. Well, and it's you know, it's 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 a fantastic online my, uh, magazine, uh, Brent. I mean, I'm always uh, always happy. To, to to see your announcement of the latest issue in my email box so you know I'm just uh, I, I'm, I'm so happy that it's uh, continuing uh, to be to be published in one form or another well let's uh, let's go over to uh, uh, Tom Tom Wortman and Tom is the co-director of the Cleveland uh, UF ufology project the oldest continually running UFO organization in the United States, as well as being the chief field investigator for MUFON of Ohio. Tom, it's really great to have you with us tonight. Oh, it's great to be here. Matter of fact, there is a little change in that now. I've also taken over as state director for MUFON of Ohio. Oh, really? I did that since, yeah, I, did that since uh, I think, a little bit before last time I talked to Tim. So, a little change of hats there, but more mm -hmm. responsibilities, as you know. Well, okay, well, what kind of responsibilities does that, does that bring you now? Well, I used to handle the bulk of all the cases. Now I've got a tremendous chief field investigator working for it, but now it's just kind of overseeing everything and really kind of expanding the group out. Um, because, as you know, one of the big things is just getting the word out to people and really, to me, educating people. Uh, my background has been in ed education now for 30-plus years. And I like to turn a lot of things that we do in educational experiences, trying to make the individuals that attend our meetings – uh, read our newsletters more informed. Well, I know that uh, uh, MUFON at this point is it's the, it, uh, uh, has has been around. Oh my gosh! Um, you know, I mean, I can remember uh, like uh, uh, APRO, the aerial uh, uh, that was a aerial research phenomena organization with uh, um, uh, Coral uh, at the uh, at the head of that. And as a kid, I remember uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, get a membership of that, but I just wasn't old enough. And then, uh, and then MUFON came around, and uh, just uh, you know, it's uh, it's it's nice that MUFON has managed to survive all of these years, and uh, uh, it really has. 
uh, uh, done some just fantastic uh, uh, in investigation, and uh, you, your organization just really seems to be uh, growing by leaps and bounds. You know, over the last uh, five years or so, I mean, it just really seems to have uh, um, um, uh, you know uh, picked itself up and has uh, reached for the stars, so to speak. <laughs> Oh, you're right. Well, well I um, think, that, yeah. Don't you think, though, that the um, the TV hey, the, uh, amount Tim of publicity on the TV? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Yay! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, they tried to shut me out once again, but I you know, yeah, no but dice. you made it back. Well, yeah, Go ahead, you know, Tim I back. was getting I was getting the MUFON bulletin before it was the MUFON bulletin. I think it was called Sky Look or something like that. Uh, well, many, Sky many, was, many. Uh, Skylook was a, a publication by a Norma Short out in out near St. Louis, yes. I believe. And uh, yes. it was originally, I think, the Midwest UFO group. Walt Andrus had kind of separated himself from APRO. He was dissatisfied mm -hmm. about something. And so he struck out on his own uh, about 1969, I believe. Uh, and well, that's when the change of, you know, it started to form then. Well, well you know, really good, old, uh, good old Coral Lorenzen had a way of irritating almost everybody. <laughs> now, th their, 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 research, their research work was terrific. They put out a good uh, a bulletin. They had brown breaking work. Uh, in fact, their librarian, uh, Alan Benz, has been on the, uh, the show here. He's a friend of mine, uh, lives out in uh, Tucson, where, of course, APRO was uh, headquarters. But a lot of people had the personality clashes with them. Um, with the Cora Lorenzen for whatever problem. She was um, kind of just rigid, that would be the word, rigid in her ways. Hey, Tim, I wanted to ask you if you know, yes. uh, you know, for, for a long time, their files has been locked away like in a garage or a storage shed somewhere. Have you heard, has there any bit, been any kind of movement on uh, getting yeah, well, those you know, out? I, I, think we, I think we asked Alan Benz uh, about that when he was on the, uh, the program. And he was not even sure uh, where they uh, where they were located. Now you know all the bulletins are on the um, Open Mind, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, website. Uh, I wouldn't say every single one of them because I don't even know how many they publish. But uh, certainly, uh, you know, a, a dozens and dozens of them are are on the Open Mind website. And every once in a while, I go and uh, I read a um, you know a, 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 an article or two out of it. Now, of course, um, APRO was a lot when it came to the um, uh, the the you know sighting reports and stuff like that. They were a lot less uh, strict than the NICAP. Pretty much, it was the two organizations that ran uh, the whole UFO uh, derby uh, at the uh, at the time. And of course, Major Kehoe he likes uh, sightings by pilots and police officers and mm -hmm. military personnel. Where where Coral and Jim Lorenzen, uh, they got into a little bit more kinky UFO type of stuff. You know, <laughs> they had they had their their little little uh, little men reports and their hairy humanoids. In fact, in fact, next week we're having on a um, individual who has uh, done several books on uh, on humanoids. So it's one of my favorite subjects. I love a good hairy humanoid. <laughs> There's not, not, nothing, nothing like that. That it. didn't sound right there for a minute, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah, come to think of it, you're right. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I retract that. Well, uh, South, South America sure had them, and, and APRO did open up a lot of material from South America that we might not know about today. You know, uh, with like the Oliver T. Fontes, you know, the the abduction there of this man who. A farmer who was abducted, taken to border craft in 1957 and had a sexual encounter. One of the first that we'd heard about in ufology. And oh, and oh, you mean Boas. Uh, uh, Boas. Villa. Boas. Villa Boas. Villa Boas. Boas, Villa, yeah. I was thinking, yeah. I was thinking of the Boas. doctor out of Rio de Janeiro, yeah. Um, and, you know, he became a, a lawyer later on in life and uh, a, a very respected lawyer and even um, went on a TV show before he passed away and... and uh, retold the story and didn't you know didn't change a detail yeah i guess he was if i remember correctly he was out um, on his tractor one night i guess he had gone out pretty late to to, uh, to uh, work in the field because it was uh, so oppress oppressively hot you know during the daytime and then he saw this uh, the object land and was invited on board the ship 
and I'm sure the that incident uh, changed his life forever. You know, but but sex with aliens, sex with aliens isn't isn't all that rare for good or for bad. I mean, uh, there seems to be a lot of the whoopee cushion goes all over the universe. I would say, I, I you know, maybe they come, <laughs> yeah, maybe they come time, to Earth. Back at that time, it was kind of of a new phenomenon, but nowadays, uh, you know, it's pretty pretty widespread pretty and all common. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My girlfriend's yeah. an alien. So what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you gotta get her on the show sometime. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, maybe, 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 maybe yes, maybe no. It depends. Well, I tell you, there are all kind, there are all kinds of stories out there. When it comes to UFOs, uh, you never, you just when you think you've heard the last of it, um, you haven't heard the last of it. I mean, that's just the, that's just the way it, uh, that's just the way it, uh, it goes. Now, I, I understand b- both of our guests uh, this evening have been uh, investigating. Uh, a new uh, abduction experiences is that right tom that's right okay. uh, why don't that's a funny little buzz there um why don't you start <laughs> out and, and give us a little detail on on the case you've been investigating well we had one come in it's it's been under investigation for some time it actually came in uh, august of um, 2014 and it's one that came in as a star team case where uh they notified mufon headquarters and when the case reviewed, it was about two fishermen that had missing time uh, in a state park called Salt Fork State Park, which is in kind of southern Ohio. Uh, what happened is the individuals went out to their, their favorite fishing hole, which a lot of guys have. Uh, it used to go down there basically every weekend. And they went down there so often, it's wondered that they even had a, a girlfriend and a wife anymore uh, because they lived there <laughs> almost every, every week. Yeah. I'm serious. They had to be really yeah, tolerant. Yeah. And the thing that was even unique about it was it was a 40, let's just say a 40-year-old and a 19-year-old. And the 19-year-old was the daughter of the 40-year-old's boyfriend. Now, Mm -hmm. they had a bond that was like closer than father and son. I mean, if it was my daughter and her boyfriend, it would have been a lot more stress, put it that way. Uh, But they hung out. They basically could start one sentence, finish it themselves. They had that type of camaraderie between them. Well, they went out to Salt Fork in the evening on a Friday night, set up camp. And when they started setting up camp, uh, they had a normal routine they went through. They put a um, their fishing poles directly by the water. They had them propped up, hanging into the lake. They had lawn chairs that he had set in all night long. Uh, right behind that, they had a um, little canopy set up that they had their coolers underneath. And they had a fire beyond that, just out of distance of all of it. And they even played a game all night long, which they would guess how long it would be before they'd have to put logs on a fire. They had a habit of putting logs on a fire every half hour exactly. So they would guess to see how close they'd come to that half hour time span. The other thing they did was they also rebated their fishing poles every half hour all night long. I'm not a great fisherman. Uh, and it's obvious, uh, but in this case, they had their technique down so they knew what worked. So as they started out the night, they had their routine started. The fire was going. The canopy was all set up. They even had glow sticks tied to their fishing poles. And they remembered about 1030 at night, they kind of looked off to the north. As they looked to the north, they see a series of lights passing over the sky. And the lights kind of went back and forth, very low on the horizon. And they would disappeared from view. But they said that the lights themselves were about the size of a nickel at arm's length, which is pretty good size. Uh, it was probably equivalent to just about the moon, if you really think about it. Well, for some reason, they watched the lights for a while. And then it's almost like they got bored or disinterested in them. They went back to fishing. 1130, lights came back up again. And here the lights are going, again, low across the horizon in a similar area. They continued fishing that night, again, playing their game, how close they could come to the uh, half-hour time frames. They also had contact with the wife and girlfriend because they called them all night long to check to make sure that they're okay, see how their fishing trips were going. And they had that um, contact all night long. And that's also, by the way, why they picked that area at Salt Fort because they had good contact with their cell phones. Next thing you know, about um, 
one thirty in the morning, they heard this shrill sound. And it was, they said, a cry of almost a woman screaming to herself. Mm. Now, this state park, besides in this case having um, uh, their experience that night, also has the highest amount of Bigfoot sightings in the state of Ohio. So it's got some paranormal connections back then. One of my friends who's a Bigfoot investigator said, hey, yeah, they're definitely down there. And he says, if you heard a shrill woman's cry, that had to be Bigfoot. Hmm. Well, I don't know about that. I mean, I like my buddy. I like Fred. Great guy. But I'm like, Fred, Fred, just because they sound like a shrill woman screaming doesn't mean it has to be Bigfoot. <clears throat> well, also in that same region, uh, right across from where they were fishing at, there is a monument to a girl who died in a cave. She was climbing at this cave area and fell. And she died when she was 13 years old. So there's also rumors of paranormal activity in that same region. Well, that shrill cry freaked these two guys out so bad. They started throwing everything back in their pickup truck, started thinking about it, saying, let's just get the heck out of here. Let's go back home because I have a very uneasy feeling about what's going on. Hmm. Now, they told me how many hours they'd been down there. They'd been down a ridiculous amount of hours. And if you'd been to that same place so often, to me, the sound of a woman's voice crying out wouldn't be that upsetting. You'd kind of just say, okay, maybe it's somebody on the other side of the lake. You wouldn't freak out and leave. But for whatever it was, it got them so spooked they almost left. About 15 minutes later, again, they were playing their game about putting logs on the fire. And they said, well, it's not quite time yet. Let's give it a few more minutes. The 40-year-old was sitting in a lawn chair. The 19-year-old was standing up by his fishing pole. Um, rebaiting his hook. The next thing you know, it's kind of like one of those um, Twilight Zone episodes. The 40-year-old looks up and he knows it's start, the sun's starting to come up. Hmm. And he looks at his daughter's boyfriend and says, hey, dude. Again, this is one of those favorite words I think a lot of these people use. <laughs> dude, dude, dude. You're not going to believe this, dude. But it's 519 in the morning. The, four, the 19-year-old almost falls over at that point. For some reason, he lost his balance. He'd been standing by his fishing pole the whole time, which he said he wouldn't do. He doesn't remember anything from approximately 1.45 to 5.19 in the morning. Wow. They looked at each other. I mean, they both panicked at this point. They're like, what happened? I don't know. Well, the wife, the girlfriend had been trying to contact him. They also lost contact at that time with him. Well, you probably would and I would. We're like, okay, they freaked out. They threw everything back in the pickup truck that they had. They took the canopy down. And in the process, they noticed that the fire was completely burned out. Hmm. The fire, which is burning okay at 145, had burned down so far that they couldn't even put kindling on to get restarted. They would have had to restart the fire completely from scratch. So now we're, we're, well, ta we're talking about four hours? Well, in this case, you figure 145 to 519 mm -hmm. in the morning, a little over, what, two and a half hours, something like that? Mm -hmm. Three and a fraction hours? Yeah. And they grabbed everything, threw it in a pickup truck, headed back home. And once they got home, they're like, we don't know what happened. But they decided to call MUFON and turn a report in. They filed a report early morning on a Saturday morning. And Craig Lang, who's in charge of um, that area, called me up that morning and says, Hey, Tom, I got a case you need to get on right now. These guys are spooked. I don't know what happened, but he started typing the report up. And as he's typing it up, he says, I'll have it to you in maybe like 20, 30 minutes, something like that. Well, you know, I'm uh, spooked just listening to it. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, it gets way better than that, believe me, Tim. Um, when they turned the report in, uh, I was waiting on it. I'm very thorough. I like to really dig into details and as not, uh, move on to do scientific research. In the time frame that I was waiting on Craig to turn the report into me, I'd gone ahead and pulled flight patterns over to region. And I found two aircraft, one that um, 
came over at approximately 1130, which is kind of close to the time frame that they saw the second set of lights. But I found nothing on the first set of lights at 1030. Hmm. I couldn't explain that. The closest aircraft was about, um, remember right, like six, seven miles away. It wouldn't appear nowhere near as big as that, that size of a nickel they claimed. Well, I also went back, pulled local dockets, because I'm like, if I'm going to go down the woods with somebody, I want to know who they are. I don't want to have a deliverance type situation <laughs> on my hands here, you know? Uh, I don't want to be doing a Ned Beatty or anything like that, you know? So I thought, let's find out what these guys are. And I researched as much as I could over the internet, because I mean, Facebook, LinkedIn, all these things are great resources you can turn to real quick. Uh, I got some information about them. Finally, the report came through. I called the gentleman up, the 40-year-old. Uh, we talked for some time, and I said, tell you what, how would you like to go back to the den of the lion, basically? What? Mm. I said, I'd like to take you back down tonight, and let's walk through that whole thing and repeat it, just as basically it went down. And they agreed to. Uh, we met at a... Um, uh, truck stop on the way down because they lived uh, close to the Akron area and Salt Fork. I mean, you're probably talking 80 to 100 miles from where they're at. And we met at this truck stop. We talked over the events. And again, like an investigator, I was reviewing everything they said to make sure it compared back to the report that was turned in. And everything was matching right on 100%. Now, everything they now, said. Tom, how how, how secluded of an area is this? Are we talking about you could drive for 20 minutes and not see another vehicle? You could go down there, and there's several houses not that far away, but nothing wow. in visible range of where they were at. Uh, mm -hmm. The closest one, as a matter of fact, under Tim, was across a lake, and it was kind of being secluded way behind trees back in. The only people they said that were down there at that time frame were there was two fishermen they said normally hung out on the other side of the lake they had on their um, lantern all night long and they drank beer all night long and got drunk every weekend <laughs> yeah I guess it's a great life if he can do it you know <laughs> and, a real and, uh, fish fry yeah but other than that I mean you had to go a ways probably about half a mile a mile to get to some of the closer houses and it was more like very very rural farm area with rolling hills. So it wasn't like you had direct view of a lot of things going on either. Um, well, even you know, going, you know I, up, up, I, top, we're, yeah, we're we on pins up. and needles here, but I know we've got a break coming up in just a few seconds. And so we're going to leave this uh, as a cliffhanger because this, this is a fascinating uh, story. You know, for those out there, other <laughs> talk show hosts who say, oh, there's nothing new in ufology. Nonsense. You just don't have on the right guests because there's a there's a lot of activity going on and we're hearing from two very well grounded researchers this evening we're talking to tom and we're talking to brent and tim schwartz is my co-host now back to exploring the bazaar with two of the most electrifying researchers in the paranormal, your hosts, Timothy, Timothy Beckley, Beckley and Tim Swartz. All right. So, Tim, this is the time I always remind uh, our listening audience that uh, if, if you want to call in, uh, ask questions to our guests, uh, uh, Britt and Tom, uh, now's the time to do it. Well, I mean, the entire program. You know, just, you know, we want to hear from you anytime during this show. Uh, text us, tweet us, you know, mental telepathy. You know, I don't care. You know, just uh, maybe write a note in a bottle and throw it in the ocean. Yeah, maybe take a while for it. To <laughs> or how about, how take about in a sp space capsule? There you go. That's right. You know, get the Ouija board out. You know, it may, it may be a while before it gets to us, but uh, I'm sure it will eventually. So uh, we want to hear from you. You know, we'll hear from your questions. Uh, and uh, so, uh, Tim, you want to, uh, uh, shall we continue on with uh, uh, Tom's story? Uh, I know we left on a cliffhanger there. I think we well, left we, off we, with. We, we, uh, did, we did indeed, but we also yeah. want to turn to Brent uh, in just a few minutes to hear his uh, in a uh, new case that he's been investigating. But, Tom, continue on uh, with the story because okay. it's certainly, certainly um, you know, it's chilling enough. 
Okay. Well, what happened was, is we met at a truck stop and they told me we're going to drive 80 miles an hour all the way down to this place about a hundred miles away. I'm like, you're driving 80 miles an hour. The guy says, I drive 80 everywhere. Well, first of all, MUFON doesn't pay for my tickets. And the second thing is, if I get pulled over by a trooper, the last thing I'm going to tell the trooper is the reason I'm driving 80 miles an hour is I'm following a guy where he was abducted at last night by aliens, you know? <laughs> so anyway, we drove down there. We did a whole reenactment of everything that was going on. They repeated everything just like the report was turned in. They showed me the areas where everything occurred at. And I also took a number of samples at the same time off of their car. And they also had a change of clothes, and they changed out their clothes that they had that night before they left. And I also got those. Now, one thing I'd say is, remember how mom always used to tell you to wear clean underwear because you ever went out someplace, got in a wreck, you know, go to the hospital, you don't want to be embarrassed. Well, another thing you want to do is wear fuchsia underwear. <laughs> because when I got the clothes from the one individual, I'm like, okay, really? <laughs> Uh, because he had on like fuchsia underwear. So I'm like, okay. Was it <laughs> yeah. fuchsia? Was it fuchsia before the incident? Uh, no, not well. Yeah, it was before <laughs> <laughs> it would have been brown afterwards. If it was me. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, oh, yeah. uh, we, we gathered the clothes and I ba begged all the clothes up, took them back with me and we did the whole reenactment and the whole time, both of them were so on pins and needles. They were just about ready to jump out of their seat at any moment. Any little sound that they heard, the 19-year-old was basically almost to jump out of his shoes. He kind of, best way to define him is he was like Barney Fife, as hyper as he was. Um, and I tried not to react to anything that he was doing out there because to me it was just like normal noise in the woods. Except one time I felt a sensation. And I, I don't claim to be psychic, but I do have sensations at times related back to experiences I had in the 1960s. Um, I felt a sensation off in one direction and he reacted at the same time. And I'm like, okay, I'd like to know more about that. Well, we finished up that night. I even checked their truck and they had no beer, no alcohol. They only had bottled water. Like they said, um, we drove back that night, but you know, sometimes some unique things happen that's out of the norm. We're driving back 80 miles an hour, just like he stated. And on that drive back, all of a sudden we come around the turn and here's a cell phone tower directly ahead of us. Here's this brilliant beacon flashing directly ahead of him. Without knowing it, he slowed down below 50 miles an hour. As long as the cell phone tower is in view, he was drove slow. The minute he got past the tower, it's automatically back up to 80 miles an hour. I didn't say anything to him that night, but I approached him about it a week or so later. And I said, did you know that you slowed down at one point on the way back? He goes, I did. I always drive 80. I said, no, at one point when you saw a cell phone tower, you slowed down below 50 miles an hour. I had no recall that he even did that. He didn't know what happened at all. Um, we've got the clothes. I took the clothes to a friend of mine to be examined. And we did find some things on the clothes uh, related back to paint, which they were in construction. But under an ultraviolet light, um, there's some things showing up that appeared a little bit out of the norm, possibly. And we're still trying to extract what that is by u potentially using solvents to pull those off to see what it is. But there was something showing up unusual under the clothing. And when you looked at the clothing, you could see kind of a pinkish cast on one of the gentleman's jackets, a blue jacket. Also, they showed me, um, they took pictures right after the incident of rashes that appeared on their body. It wasn't like, in this case, mosquito bites or things like that. It was under where their clothing was at. And they started sending me photograph after photograph in the afternoon of, before I, I met them, of all these marks in their body. Now, one thing went through my mind is when I'm going through these, I'm like, okay, here's one of the chest, here's the arms. All of a sudden, next thing I'm, get, I'm getting pictures of body parts that I bet Stanton Friedman, you know, and Bill Burns never had pictures coming through the email like this, uh, showing parts of the body. That I'm like, wait a minute, this is a little bit too much information here, gentlemen, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they, there were races in other parts of the body, too. I, I'll say that. Or at <laughs> least the that's what they were claiming. Exactly. Exact, that's what they're claiming. Now, they did fade after about um, 
probably about 18 hours. And some of the marks I could say were related back to clothing, but some appeared to be rashes on there. And we've met several times since then, and you talk about nervous. They were nervous a week, two weeks after the event. They didn't work for almost a week, both of them. And the one gentleman even owned his own company. They didn't go outside the house after dark because they were totally afraid to go outside the house after dark. And whatever happened to them that night, um, they didn't say abducted by aliens, but they kept saying over and over again, we were missing all that time and we have no clue what happened. And to me, this is one of those stories that, that make you scratch your head. And I went down the following week. And when I went down the following week, I did my own investigation, number one, just to see if they were back. Because they told me they were too scared to go back down, and they weren't. Who was down there that night was the fishermen on the other side of the lake, drunk with their Coleman lantern. They, they were there. Never have, they wouldn't even notice the alien if it stood in front what, of them, what, right? <laughs> they, they could have been abducted, been experimented on in all sorts of ways, and they would have known any different. Uh, I did my own walk around of the region. I took EMF detectors down. I took other meters down and I detected no magnetism because I was getting some hints on what to potentially look for by MUFON headquarters. But what was kind of unique is where they were at. I found absolutely nothing as I went around a corner around a big tree line into another clearing I'm down there like three o'clock in the morning by myself in a state park thinking Bigfoot could walk up at any second. I'm waiting for that shrill woman's cry. And as I'm, I'm walking around, all of a sudden I had this sensation, this sensation went through my whole body. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, whatever it was happened about right here. And I had a flashlight on I aimed at the ground and I was standing in a perfect circle of dead grass. It was the only circle in, in that area of dead grass. I'm like, okay, no, don't read too much into this, but this is kind of creepy. Um, I took ground samples from around there that I've got. And when I approached the witness a couple weeks later about that, I said, you know, I, I went down on a week that you weren't there just, just to verify your stories. I also took samples, did some research. And I said, I was walking around the park down there and I had a very weird sensation. You know, I, I, don't, I couldn't explain what it was. And the 40-year-old goes, was it by, around the corner from where we're at by the big tree? Mm. And that's exactly where I was standing. I'm like, how the heck would this guy know where, I was, where it happened at? How would he know? And this even sent, you know, chills up my spine even more because, wait a minute, oh, how? And the other thing was, is how, why was I getting the sensations? Well, I don't want to go too long here, but I've had experiences going back to the 1960s myself. And one of the thoughts was, is since I've had my own personal experiences of encounters like this, that maybe there's a connection going back that I'm kind of like lighting up, almost like picking up a radio signal. When I get in those areas that are like, wait a minute, what's this guy doing here? We had him 40 years ago. Why is he in this area where this just happened at? Now, you said you had a sensation. Was this the same sensation that you had had uh, the week previously when you were down there originally with the gentleman? It was exactly the same sensation. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I've had this several other times, and it doesn't occur in every case, but it's on these special cases that really just stand out, that are unique, that have unusual things about them. Now, now a and it's not like I'm getting normal uh, it, it, feels. Yeah. It, it, is, is there any uh, plans to... Uh, uh, subject the uh, witnesses uh, or participants to uh, hypnosis? Well, I want to give it some time to him. I didn't want to do it right away. Yeah. Yes, but yes. I do I, I do want to reach out to him now that, you know, basically the dust has settled for some time. And I want to see if anything has come out on its own. Mm -hmm. uh, but we've talked several times since then. And, I mean, the 40-year-old is still spooked about what happened that night. The 19-year-old mm -hmm. is more back to normal, but the 40-year-old, was a control freak for time, and his wife confirmed that. Mm. But, you know, going back to his sensations again, the night that I, I did my last interview with him, he has a house kind of out on the outskirts of town that's out in a, a wooded area. He said there's about, I think, 40 or 70 acres of woods across from him. As we're sitting on his porch that night, he said, you know, are there Indian mounds around here? 
And he goes, it's directly across the street. How did you know? I said, I felt, <laughs> I felt <laughs> something unusual. And this guy's like, I don't know who you are, but I, he couldn't figure that out. But they come and go. It's not anything I can turn off or on like a switch. They just come and go as they please, you know, basically. Well, you know, over over the years, of course, there have been um, a lot of uh, quite a few cases involving uh, people out late at uh, night uh, fishing. You had the two uh, gentlemen in the Pescagoula, uh, Mississippi, back in 1973. And then, of course, you have. Oh, that was what, that uh, was very similar, though, because you had you had an older man and uh, and a younger man. It, you know, it, right. out, out fishing, yeah. It, it, uh, at first, I thought about that, and I thought, did they read the book? <laughs> but there were some unique things popping up that were totally different than what happened in that case. And and then, of course, and you, you look have for those the, unusual uh, things. Is it the uh, Allegash? Um, was that New Al- Hampshire? Allegash is right. Yeah, New Hampshire. Right. Go ahead uh, Maine. I believe that's what yeah. I'm I'm from Maine, so I know this one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, that that's a... That's a pretty uh, uh, hair-raising uh, incident right there. With the, yeah, it uh, the was. Four, four fishermen uh, out late at night and uh, <laughs> something uh, grabs hold of them. Yeah, literally. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Ray Fowler investigated that one very thoroughly. Right. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, uh, Brent, um, we, you've been investigating a uh, uh, an abduction case as well? Well, I've been I've been investigating a number of them, and and I've been doing a survey because I wanted to uh, uh, try to isolate different different patterns. You know, as you know, the the paranormal keeps coming up in in case after case, and I've been seeing this for years, and so I'm I'm trying to do more statistical work. It's not not easy. Yeah. Uh, a lot of you know, but um, what has impressed me too is is the caliber of, of a lot of the people. Uh, two of them are are you know have had a background as college professors and one's an aerospace engineer and a lady with a master's degree in experimental psychologist, a psychology and a, and a, and then there's a geologist. And, uh, and when they're telling you the stories, it's like, um, I, you know, you get to a point and they say, now they stop kind of apologizing, you know, because they say, I know this, this doesn't make any sense, but this is what happened. And I said, that's all you get to say. I've, I've heard these things before, you know, and um, one that I've, I've recently been talking with, with these people uh, on the phone, they're up, up in the Chicago area, and this lady who has this, um, <clears throat> you know, has been in, in a lot of uh, business uh, dealings. She has a, a degree in experimental uh, psychology, a master's degree, and she had a support group at her, at her home. And uh, and uh, on this one occasion, uh, this aerospace engineer who had had his own experience back in '63 that was investigated by Dr. Heineck and, and Bud Hopkins, um, he's in the support group, and uh, there's all of a sudden uh, by the ceiling, and quickly the this opening appears and the aerospace engineer and the lady sitting next to him see this hooded being you know just sort of standing there and um interestingly this is really the same living room where she had an experience where there was production that occurred uh in her home uh a previous year where her youngest son was taken and she tried to go through this uh portal that was just the opposite side of the room from where this other incident happened and and uh, tried to get into where her son was. She could hear him uh, crying out and this hand of a, of a being stopped her and mentally told her everything was all right just, just to go back. She wasn't supposed to go into this opening. And a number of people have described... Uh, you know, being taken through like opening in the wall or something, um, where oh, the yeah. normal. There's a fellow, a, de- a fellow uh, who lives in uh, New Jersey. Maybe you've heard of him, David Hutchins. You know, David. He he's the painter. He paints all these uh, uh, weird landscapes. Uh, he claims that he has fathered numerous uh, children on other planets and so forth. 
and and his experience starts like that where the wall opens up and he he enters to to the realm right i know um a uh, friend of mine in the field that i've worked with uh, a number of years uh brett oldham uh who lives up in the nashville area um uh, he had an experience out in las vegas some years back where um he feels like he has a hybrid child because he and the woman he was with who was pregnant, uh, suddenly there were aliens in the room and they were both remember being taken and the, the, the fetus being removed. And, uh, and that's, you know, I don't know. I've, I've always, I've always thought of that as just being a little bit too far fetched and wild to accept, but maybe that's just my, my boundary that I've had, uh, you know, um, uh, a set is, you know, I have some preconceived notions and ideas, I guess, too. And when it comes to fathering uh, children or having children on some other planet or something, I just kind of, I don't know, draw the line. Maybe just because I'm frightened of the idea or it's too uh, bizarre to even accept. Now, uh, Tim, talking about um, uh, portals and walls opening, ha- haven't you written about a couple of cases? I I think there's there's one in Charles Fort where a couple was in a hotel room. In, oh yeah, in yeah, France. that's yeah. Uh, so, something like that. I mean, it's uh, I, it's one of those stories. It took place in the 19th century, definitely. Yeah. But it's one of those stories mm-hmm. that you've heard, you know, several different versions of it. But I mean, it was widely reported in the uh, local newspapers where it happened. And it was a couple of travelers who had stopped at an inn. And uh, the uh, uh, other other people staying in, in the same building heard this couple, you know, like screaming. And actually, they complained to the police. And when the police checked on them, uh, they found this couple in just uh, like this state of terror. And they said that a, uh, a a hole had opened up into the floor, and that they could hear screams coming from it. And then their own screams were being echoed back. And the husband started to be pulled into it. I, I mean, I don't know if it was like, you know, he was being drawn into it. And the wife was, uh, you know, had a hold of his arms and was trying to drag him out. Uh, but then it, uh, it, it, it closed and they found themselves actually outside the building in the street rather than in their room. And that's when the, uh, I guess, the local gendarmes found them. And they had no idea how they had gotten there. Uh, at at the time, but you, you know, Brent, your story also it it, it also reminds me of um, uh, I I talked to a guy not too long ago by the name of uh, John Carlson, who uh, uh, him and a couple other people were up in Oregon, uh, Bigfoot hunting, and for like two nights in a row they kept seeing this portal. Uh, they described it as a portal. It, was, it started out like as a ball of light, and then it enlarged, and these like dark. Uh, two dark kind of dwarf-shaped uh, creatures came out of this portal and would uh, try to rush them. And they'd shine their flashlights on these creatures, and the creatures would disappear, and the portal would disappear. But then the process would start all over again. And uh, all night long, for two nights in a row, the same scenario would happen. Right. And, it, and it's, you know, you, you when you go into this stuff like that, that early case you talked about, where it was, sounded like a portal. Um, it's like all these stories of little people, and, and the sexual elements do, you know, come out of those too, you know, and you have the incubus and succubus and and all these historical factors, and, uh, you know, they, like John Keel pointed out years ago, they they may be a little variation on different aspects than what we, we see in here today, but they're, it seems to be part of a, uh, an ongoing phenomenon, and, um, the thing with 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 Brett Oldham too, uh, you know, he 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 had experiences going back like so many to childhood, uh, about age five, seeing a gray, and then also she started seeing ghosts. And it seems like their experiences with the so-called aliens also opened them up to all sorts of other experiences, ghosts, um, uh, Bigfoot or Mothman type things or whatever, and. I know that with with Brett, uh, he became a paranormal investigator. In fact, I was with him and and Sandy Nichols of Thompson Station, Tennessee, uh, back in 2010. And I had never I tried a number of times to do electronic voice phenomena, hadn't really had much success. But working with them, 
um, and Brett and his wife, Gina, in particular, had introduced us to the spirit box. And I know a lot of people have some negative things in the field to say about this, but we recorded each of these sessions and we were at different locations and, and John Keel was coming through and he had passed away, you know, the previous year. Wait, wait so, a minute, John Keel, John Keel was coming through the spirit box? Right, the words John Keel. And so mm -hmm. uh, that was like in May of 2010. He passed away on July 3rd of 2009. By July 3rd of 2010, we were having a session at uh, Sandy Nichols' home in Thompson Station, and Brett and Gina were there, and they were going to do a spirit box. And so I said, let's try and contact John Keel because this is his one-year you know, anniversary is passing. So he did two sessions, and right off the bat, we asked John Keel to say his name in a male voice said John Keel, asked him what he thought about Bigfoot, and this male voice, and it sounded like the same voice and was very sarcastic, said, smuck Bigfoot, see? Then, <laughs> 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 yeah, I know. <laughs> and, and I'm like those people who say, I know this sounds unbelievable, but, and then there was the, um, you know, I didn't think that Brett and Sandy knew too much about John Keel, so I asked him about the, um, uh, what he thought of Jadu. And uh, this voice says, Jadu, eh? And I said, yeah, Jadu. And, and anyway, this voice goes on, and he's fading in and out, but he just goes on this big, long talk. At one point, I hear the words, um, into the fire, into the fire. And just rambling on, I couldn't tell what all he said, and something about take it outside what all that was about but that night there was all, there was so much going on that I was skeptical but then I after all that happened that night I had to believe and since then um, I've got John Keel here at the house uh, first and last name and I know that that's not something that's coming through the radio frequencies you know uh, AM channel very often <laughs> mm. all, all right, right Brent we're going to have to interrupt you here because it's time for us to take our break at the top of the hour. So when we come back, we will continue our conversation with Brett Rains and Thomas Workman. You're listening to Exploring the Bazaar on KCR Digital Radio Network. We'll be right back. Exploring the Bazaar. bazaar. Your e-ticket ride into the world of the paranormal. Strap yourself in as we traverse the universe exploring the unexplained. UFOs, UFOs, UFOs ghosts, ghosts, lost worlds, lost worlds cryptozoology, cryptozoology, as well as other dimensions. dimensions. It's time to take back the night. Back the night. Now, your electrifying hosts of Exploring the Bazaar, Timothy Beckley, and Tim Swartz. Well, it's a wonder we're still alive after the, all those weekly uh, bouts with the uh, uh, thunderclaps and, and, and all that. But we're, we're here, and we're having a marvelous time, and a great show. Is uh, We're really into the abduction phenomena and things that go bump in the night pretty thick and heavy here with our guest Thomas Wortman and Brent Rains. So now, uh, Brent, were you in the middle of telling us a story about a recent experience that you investigated? Well, there's, there's you know, um, been a number of people who have described have you know being UFO experiences, abductees, contactees, and I've been you know studying their stories and and emailing them. Having, I've got a questionnaire form, a survey form. If anyone out there would uh, be so kind as to want to. Joining my survey, I'd sure appreciate it. I'm, I'm looking to see how prevalent these different patterns are, uh, psychic, psychological, physical, and and try to, you know, see what I can determine. Uh, there's a lot of very anomalous, high strangeness things that, that emerge in, in these in these areas. And I've been doing this for, for a pretty good while. Um, you know, I was... Um, 
I was I spent several months in Ohio back in 1975. I wanted to to do the uh, see. I'm originally from Maine, and I was staying with uh, a family that was also both husband and wife UFO investigative team. Uh, Charles and Jerry Wilhelm at the time of the UFO Investigators League in Fairfield outside Cincinnati. And so I would investigate, follow up on a lot of the stories. And that was how I met back in August of 75, uh, Earl Neff, one of the, the founder of the, the founder, I guess, of the uh, Cleveland ufology project. And um, at the time he'd been in touch with Dr. Berthold Schwartz, uh, prominent psychiatrist and parapsychologist and also a man who's been studying had been studying the UFO phenomena and he was particularly interested in the UFO par paranormal elements and and so he had informed me you know confidentially about Earl Neff's situation and so he was at a meeting at uh, uh, Richard Lee's home in in Akron and I came there and we met in a private room to describe, he was describing things at that time that really intrigued him. And he said that he had worked in years previous with Elliot Ness. And so he didn't scare easily, but, but uh, some of the strange things that were happening to him were really, really uh, quite unusual. And he didn't know quite what to make of it, but he would be doing a UFO talk and people would come up to him afterwards and uh, say, you know, we saw these strange auras or figures around you when you're up there talking and and then uh, he even had a photographer come in and try to and one time uh, a woman approached him and there was just a wall behind him and you know there was no one standing behind him but when she asked you know how come no one had ever silenced him or something? Voice, maybe we like what you're saying. And he turned around and was just a wall there, and she heard it, he heard it very clearly. And I think Larry Morris, who was uh, her, tell him what, what happened. And he was having a lot of these events and at first he was you know kind of keeping a low profile I know that when I when I uh, first um, corresponded with him in 72 he was very skeptical of many of these type stories and he said about the only ones that he ever really believed was like Betty and Barney Hill he'd had him on on one of his radio shows so anyway well, you, know, uh, I, you know the reason uh, I, I had an antenna uh, a large uh, radio antenna put on my uh, the roof of my house when I was a, a teenager so that I could tune in and listen to the Cleveland Ufology Roundtable. And uh, ah. recently I was, uh, recently, which Earl Neff was the, the host of, or co-host, and recently I was listening to an old uh, episode that someone had archived on the internet. And lo and behold, he says, oh, we have a postcard here from Timothy Beckley asking us a question, and it was 1966, uh, and I was I was listening to the Cleveland Ufology Roundtable, and I actually recorded uh, uh, some of them. Now I lived in New Jersey at the uh, the time, and uh, that's quite a distance uh, away. But uh, you know, you could you could hear it. You just sat there with the dial and tuned it in a little. And some nights the uh, some weeks the a reception would be okay, and some weeks, uh, you know, it would be almost impossible uh, to get on the uh, on the skip. But yeah, was we, it we was it a uh, was it a clear channel station? Well, I couldn't tell you that. I I don't know. But well, um, w, do you remember? W O R was a clear channel. Yeah. Oh, it was. Yes, yes. I yeah. I don't mm -hmm. think that this was uh, that big of a uh, a station. But uh, you know, I I don't recall offhand what uh, what station he was on. But uh, he 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 read the the letters from. Uh, uh, people, in fact, I remember he read uh, like a four-page letter from Coral Lorenzen on the air one night about some case. Wow. No, you know, that uh, thing is we worked, we worked a lot harder for our information, didn't we? <laughs> you 
You know, we, we didn't have the internet and all these uh, great networking tools that we have now. Well, I don't know. I, I think I liked it better in, 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 be in those a, days. It, it seemed, I don't know, the sharing of information, it seemed to be maybe of a little bit higher caliber. But maybe that's just who I'm plugged uh, into. I, I don't know. You know, it's kind of hard to, to say. I was used to exchanging uh, newsletters, our interplanetary news service report, with about 125 uh, similar publications all over the world. And, and some of them were not in uh, English. In fact, right here on my uh, on my bookshelf, I have printed on the the rawest paper you could possibly find a magazine or a newsletter, and I couldn't even tell you the title in Romanian, and that ba- dates back to probably 1966 or 67, and they came in from all over the world. Most of them were not too glossy, but uh, the Japanese actually put out a magazine. There was a, a magazine published in Japan called Brothers or Space Brothers, and it had some of the, yeah, it had some of the most bogus photographs of uh, of UFO, you know, UFOs like clouds and raindrops and everything that they they photographed they they saw as a UFO. But it w- it was a, a heck of a nicely produced magazine because there weren't really too many magazines, uh, you know, like professionally uh, printed magazine on the subject. Uh, the closest would be, of course, Ray Palmer's. <clears throat> Flying Sources from Other World, and uh, Fate magazine. You were at remote viewing my office the other day, were you, Tim? Because I, ju- I just happen to have two of those copies of Brothers in the Japanese version oh, on my goodness. desk the other day. Uh-huh. Uh, I'm going back archiving a lot of stuff that George Popowich had, who was oh, an yes, investigator yes, from yes, the George Akron Popovich, area back yes. in the 1960s. I've got his uh-huh. archives, and I was going through putting them all into a catalog, organizing everything. Uh-huh. And you're right. I could not believe how many magazines there were in the 1950s, 1960s, yes. from all over the world. Uh, a tremendous yeah. amount. Uh, and and uh, now some of them, there was a magazine well, I think out Rick of Hilbert. Uh, lost you there. Yeah, Rick Hilberg is, I think, who he's referring to. He's a member of Move of Ohio. He still puts out a newsletter, yeah. but I have one in my collection going back, I think, 1966. From little Ricky Hilberg, that was basically done on a mimeograph machine, but you have to admire somebody for doing this. Here, here well, we are we had, looking at fifty years later. Yeah, yeah, we had we had our own little mimeograph machine, and it started out uh, is uh, ten pages and ended up uh, forty pages, and we had as many members actually as uh, NICAP. We were up to about uh, fifteen hundred uh, subscribers on the Interplanetary News Service Report. And, of course, uh, Rick Hilberg, uh, if it wasn't for Rick, uh, Tom, you and I would have never met, I don't think, because we met That's last right. year in, Cl- in Cleveland, Ohio, at the reunion of the um, uh, National UFO Conference or Congress of Scientific Ufologists or <laughs> whatever a name uh, it, it goes under these days. And, uh, of course, Alan Greenfield and all was there, and uh, yeah, he's been a buddy of mine since we, we all started out in this when we were teenagers. Oh, yeah, and you know, in that box yeah. I went through, I found yeah. letters from Alan, um, Ricky, yeah. um, Jan Aldrich, all these individuals. I mean, going back to the 1960s, they're still uh-huh. doing this 50 years later. Yep, and it's yep. great reading these letters from people who were kids. And now you're reading the books all these years later, and great books they are. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And like you say, Rick, Rick uh, still puts out the, uh, uh, the uh, Flying Saucer Digest, UFO Digest. In fact, I got a copy of it here on my desk. It just came in, I think, yesterday. I haven't had a chance to look it over yet, but uh, uh, yeah, you know, there, there's still there's still some activity, and uh, uh, the old timers are still uh, out there, uh, you know, uh, doing as much uh, investigation as they as they can. I mean, I, I used to be more of a field researcher uh, than I am now. I don't, uh, you know, by time by time I hear the reports. Somebody's already been out and interviewed the witnesses, which is fine, because then I can invite them on the show and and uh, you know listen to the stories uh, uh, first uh, hand. But okay, so Tom, uh, the um, uh, this uh, case that you just described to us, where do you take it from here? Where do you take it from here? Uh, yeah. It's taken us a while to do the analysis on the clothes, just because there's such a backlog of stuff coming in. It takes so long to do it. Because, again, MUFON, uh, we're doing everything as a volunteer basis on here. 
uh, Phyllis Budding is doing the research on. She's doing a great job. Uh, she was giving me some results the other day, but I know I'll be getting in some more shortly. And then what I'll do is I'll probably approach um, the witnesses again about, about saying, okay, would you like to potentially go through regression? Uh, they'd have to volunteer to do it. But I would like to take them through regression to see what can come out. Uh, because to me, they've got a few points in their story which stand out as, as kind of unique. Uh, when he slowed down, when he saw the lights, to me what was happening was is the first of the lights they saw at 1030 that they couldn't find any correlation with might have been something, some object floating around the sky. I can't say it was. I can't say it wasn't. The one at 1130, I was able to track it down, and that was actually a uh, flight going from Columbus to Pittsburgh uh, by Quest Medical, which evidently they're transporting medical uh, lab sp specimens back and forth. So that one I could identify. But the earlier one, I wanted something really started at about 1030. Uh, whatever happened at 145 on, I can't say for sure. But it definitely left an impact on those individuals that, to me, all the body language said they weren't faking it. They were really intense about this whole situation. Uh, now, I'd have, like to take been, them back through have it. Have there been other, have there been other uh, reports from the immediate area over the course of, uh, you know, like uh, several decades or whatever? Um, not to my knowledge. There hasn't been on there. But, mm -hmm. again, when you think about it, uh, how many people may have had an event and never turned anything in or never wanted to talk about it? Mm -hmm. It's just one of those lot. things they wanted to brush off. Yeah, because if these gentlemen hadn't known about MUFON, we may have never heard about this whole thing. Uh -huh. You know, the, the the thing that I find curious about this story is uh, they didn't report to you any kind of um, – realization other than they noticed the sun coming up that there was like a, a a skip in time you know they were just you know going about it and then all of a sudden there's the sun coming up you know you're, a lot of right. yeah a lot of people they report you know like oh, all of a sudden there was just you know the uh, people call it I've, I've had people tell me it's like they felt like there was like a a, a record skipped across an album it was what one person told it to me you know, but but these guys, it was just, you know, boom, just one here, there, and there they are. And, and well, also, they didn't try to fill it in because, you know, the mind can try to fill in the blanks. And sometimes that information that tries to fill in may be false or it could be something they're, you know, trying to assume from the situation. They didn't. They just have no clue what happened. And two weeks later, I mean, I could not believe how intense the 40-year-old was about the fact that he lost – over two hours of time that he couldn't explain. And when I talked to his wife about it, and she goes, oh, he is completely, wants to be in possession of time. He's one of those individuals, she says, if he says he's going to be someplace at 7 o'clock and he gets in the drive at 7.01, he is mad mm -hmm. because he's lost a minute somehow. And she goes, he has to be that much in complete control of what's going on. So I really want to find out how he's reacting. Uh, the 19-year-old, I'm almost expecting, will probably be pretty much to normal other than the fact that he just has no clue what happened. But the 40-year-old, to me, he's the one that maybe something really happened to. Well, you know, it, it's very interesting about time because whatever this phenomena is, it does seem the, to have the ability to totally distort and, and warp, uh, warp time. In fact, I remember um, my friend Arthur Shuttlewood who uh, worked for the you know the newspaper Warminster England, uh, the thing over there, <laughs> and uh, uh, hundreds of people you know gathered uh, uh, on a regular basis to sky watch and saw these objects in the sky over Cradle Hill and Star Hill, and there was one occasion where hundreds of people uh, in the town of Warminster reported that their watches had stopped, and 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 they had they had missing time. Some of them, uh, uh, you know, uh, claimed that there was an entire uh, hour or however long the period of time was uh, that they could not account for. So, uh, it, you know, not only can it have a, an effect on individuals in a UFO case, but it seems to be able to uh, be able to span out even and, and encompass uh, more than just a small, uh, you know, number of people. 
Now, uh, uh, Brent, in the, in the uh, cases that you've investigated in the surveys uh, that you've done, have you found this time distortion phenomena being repeated? Right, and I have, and, and also you mentioned about, you know, clocks. There have even been reports of, of some of the timepieces uh, kind of speeding up where the person would see them uh, actually moving, you know, the hour hand, the minute hand, just moving at a fast rate and kind of like sometimes like a high-frequency sound in the room. Um, I know there was a case of a, of a beam of light coming into a room through the wall and pinning this child to the bed while the hands on the clock were spinning around and there was like this weird high-frequency noise um, in the air. And um, what? I've heard that... That, would stunt, my, that would stunt my growth for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I'd, I'd never even want to wear a watch. I mean, that's how bad and, that and, would yeah, be. A lot, a lot of, and there's a lot of experiences who also have all these electronic anomalies going on, uh, you know, with they can't wear watches. They uh, report that there's, um, you know, they, they electronic instruments start messing, uh, you know, messing up with them. Uh, more more than just coincidence. I mean, it, it'll it'll go through phases. That maybe something happens, and and suddenly there's um, all these problems with electronics right after they have an encounter experience. Uh, one woman said that she had these uh, uh, little streamers that came off her fingers when she went to the keyboard of her computer. And uh, there was another guy said that the these pictures. He said other people can verify it. Uh, flying off the wall and, and things and electronics messing up uh, right after, you know, some of his experiences. So these are areas too that, you know, uh, like paranormal investigators, uh, we could, you know, maybe use instruments like the trifield meter and such and detect, you know, I know Tom said something about using a, something like that in his investigation uh, with these, these two people he's been talking about. Right. But, That's know, one of the things I, I used. What, and one of I my wonder favorite if case, uh, okay. Go all ahead. Right. One, of, one of my favorite cases of all time, Brent, is uh, Stella Lansing, uh, who had uh, you know the ability to pick up a uh, uh, a camera like an eight millimeter or sixteen millimeter camera and pointed at the sky. And, and when she developed a film, there were a heck of a lot of weird phenomena on uh, on uh, on the on the uh, on the camera strips. You know the strips of film. Uh, how, how did you get involved in that uh, in that case? Well, because I I had made the acquaintance of uh, Dr. Berthold Schwartz, who was you know the one who actually opened up this case uh, and wrote a lot of material in Flying Saucer Review over in England. And, oh, yes, uh, included her in different books like UFO Dynamics. Um, he back in 1974 he gave me her contact information. Because I lived in Maine, so it wasn't that mm -hmm. far away for me to uh, to go and, and visit. And uh, I went down and uh, a couple times and and met with her and sky watched. And uh, there was not really anything earth shattering that happened, but we sat and we watched a lot of the videos. Uh, and then we'd go out and sky watch. And uh, I was quite intrigued and puzzled at the time by the clockwork images, you know, that, that mm -hmm. looked like the dials of a clock, but they'd be in different positions. And uh, they would often overlap uh, other frames. Now, <clears throat> I looked into that. I contacted uh, somebody out at Kodak, and they told me that it was um, these were rivets that they used to attach, say, the 50-foot lengths of uh, super eight millimeter film and put them through a developing solution and that they would attach them, you know, these different, uh, rolls of film by these little clips called, you know, yes. they called rivets. Now, I wanted to get one, but they said they were discontinuing them and, you know, and, and I know I got an angry call from Stellar saying, I could have told you Brent what this was about. Why didn't you consult with me? But, um, I'm not saying that she didn't have all, you know, some strange things going on because I, I've talked to some people that, were there and said odd things happened. Dr. Swartz had some pretty interesting experiences when he was there and saw these lights and filmed them and saw this car that, 
acted kind of mysterious, so I'm kind of a dark car that makes you think of the MIB uh, when they were seeing these, these lights. But as far as the rivets went, and I, I actually started getting rivets myself on my own 8mm movies, and mine were always near the, the beginning of the end, which coincided with what you know the, the technician at, at Kodak told me in New York. And then there was the, um, when you held them up to a light, um, one side you could actually see they were imprinted into the film, and the other side they weren't. So I figured this is where they you know, were applied with some pressure and it actually imprinted into the film. And uh, for me, it was a slam dunk, but uh, I know there was no well, but convincing now, now, of course, she, she had some other interesting photos that showed faces. Yeah, you know, she had the... Uh, weird people showing up in the uh, in the images, and I think actually now the film was silent. But when they transferred it uh, years later over to to um, video, suddenly there were voices on it as well. Yeah, I remember that. And you know, I know that oh, she well, also guys, used- guys, we have to we have to go to our break now. Unfortunately, the music is playing. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if we can do something about that. Mm. That's right. <laughs> now back to exploring the bazaar with two of the most electrifying researchers in the paranormal. Your hosts, Timothy, Timothy Beckley, Beckley and Tim Swartz. So, Tim, you know, the secret of not getting burned every week from all of those lightning strikes is to remain well grounded. There, you, so and, we, and, and aren't we on the show? I believe we are. We are. Certainly we, the are. Mo- we are certainly the most grounded host anywhere on the Internet. <laughs> That's right. Well, let's continue our conversation tonight with uh, Brent Rains and uh, Thomas uh, Wortland. Uh, Wortman, sorry, Thomas. <laughs> that, That's uh, right. Um, now, you had alluded earlier in the program about some uh, uh, personal experiences that uh, that you had while you were younger. Uh, would you care to uh, 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 talk about those? Sure. You know, I'll talk about it. I really started talking about those about not too long before I met uh, Tim the first time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what happened was is the um, I had experiences back in the 1960s. You know how you have the fragmented memories, um, things you remember to that time frame. And it started in Ohio, but really everything picked up once I moved to uh, South Carolina, right around 1964, 1965 frame. Uh, We lived uh, out in the country a little bit on there. But uh, I remembered at the one house we owned, all of a sudden I started getting terrified that something was coming towards me every night or something was coming out of a wooded area near our house every night coming towards um, where we lived at. Uh, I remember I kept watching the windows every night because I felt something was coming. I didn't know what, but it, it, I felt something was there. Uh, I remember, remember getting up, checking my room. I don't know how many times a night looking for, you know, like the little mysterious gremlins or whatever you want to call them around the room, which I never saw anything. But we moved from that house into an area, much, much, much more rural area out in the country uh, where we had some neighbors around. And it was when we lived uh, at that location that I started having bouts of sleep paralysis. Uh, the sleep paralysis became not just a random event, but became almost a nightly event. Uh, I remember laying in bed, uh, completely locked up. I couldn't move, uh, aware of all my faculties. And I felt myself drifting straight up, basically rising towards the ceiling. And it kept happening night after night after night. Now, I'll be the first one to say that sleep paralysis isn't necessarily, you know, always associated with abduction. It can be a natural occurrence, but it just left this seed in the back of my mind, mind, like what was going on back then? Well, on one night, or actually one afternoon, I should say, um, one of my buddies across the road, uh, we used to go out hunting all the time. And down in the area we're at, we were surrounded by peach orchards. We had some woods uh, off in a distance, he'd say, let's go hunting. Well, our hunting really was not true hunting. We, we shot a lot of Maytags, Frigidaires, <laughs> any appliances, pretty much any aban- anybody abandoned in the peach fields or, or, the, or the, you know, in the fields, we shot those first because they didn't move. They were easy. I don't remember killing anything with the shotguns we took out, 
But on the one given day, it was it had to be like late afternoon. We were walking out, in this case, past my buddy's house. We went clear back in the woods. I don't know how far we went back in. As we're walking through the woods, he starts looking at me saying, do you notice anything funny? And I'm like, what? He says, do you notice anything funny? He says, what do you mean? I said, I don't notice anything funny. I said, I don't hear anything funny. He goes, that's the problem. I don't hear anything. Hmm. And he was getting nervous because he heard no birds, no wildlife. He'd normally associate with the region out there. There was absolutely no sound in the woods whatsoever. We're walking deeper into the woods. And I remember looking up and I saw a silver dish-shaped object above the treetops. And this thing is just hovering there, just stationary. And I'm just looking up at this thing like, okay, I don't know what that is, but whatever, you know. And I, I don't know why I took a very lax approach to it. Because if you think about it, if you're walking to woods, you look at me, saw this large dish-shaped object, uh, who knows, maybe about 30 feet across, hovering above the treetops. You kind of freak out. But for some reason, I just watched it. We kept on walking. I never told him about it. We just kept going deeper back into the woods. Well, then he started telling me the story about what he called the Swamp Willie. Now, the Swamp Willie basically goes back to Bigfoot. And he goes, you know, Swamp Willie's back here. Hmm. I'm thinking, okay, where's the campfire at? Let's gather around the campfire. You're just trying to spook me. I was about uh, 13 at the time. He was about 15. And I thought, well, I've got a 12-gauge pump with magnums in it. I'm not afraid of a swamp bully right now. And we kept on walking deeper back in. And then he made a comment about a white owl. Hmm. And I don't remember seeing a white owl. He says, there was a large white owl ahead of us back there. I said, what white owl are you talking about? I don't remember seeing anything. And he kept getting much more intense. He started panicking. And he started almost running out of the woods. I mean, here we are with shotguns, and he's just paranoid. And he's not heading back in the opposite direction towards his house. He's heading towards the closest rural road. And most of the roads down here, I mean, if, if you could call them basically dirt with uh, a little oil or a little tar on top, you're doing good. We ran to the closest road, got out of the woods, and I don't know how far we had to walk back around eventually get back to our houses and he kept talking the whole way back about the huge white owl the one i don't remember hmm. well today i mean if you've seen some movies out there they, that white owl pops up in a number of the movies and what we did is um the, if the cleveland ufology project we had a um what we called a regression session or not a regression but really abduction meeting one night where people who had had experiences talked openly about them. And I'd never talked about mine in public before, but I thought, well, what better time to maybe go through the whole experience, but let's take it from the beginning. So I, I try to remember as much thoughts as I had, kind of make notes, write them all down. And I thought, okay, let's try going through aggression because I thought about it for a while since I'd been involved with the group. I thought, why don't we go through regression? And we had a local cup member who uh, has done regressions over, over the years. We got together at her house. Um, we went back to that time frame. Actually, a couple different time frames. One is when I lived in Ohio, the earlier times. And the second was when was down in South Carolina. When we went back to the South Carolina setting, I believe it was the second session. Um, I started describing a lot of the events going on and she didn't prompt me cause I, I have the audio tapes. I mean, when you listen to them, there was no prompting. She just let me describe the events as they went. And at one point, um, during that time down in South Carolina, I was taken, I remember basically looking around and I was inside of a craft. It was like a dome shaped area that was laying flat. And off in the distance, I could see what appeared to be something like a gray. Uh, it was basically standing on one side of the room, basically almost motionless. Then I turned to one of my sides. I turned to my, um, uh, in this case, right side. And there was one basically almost staring me right in the face. Mm. And we started going on about this whole thing. What, you know, 
she let me describe basically everything going on. And the session went for about, I think about an hour and a half. And at one point, my breathing started going totally crazy. Uh, it got extremely rapid. My heart rate went up through the roof. And I think she started getting worried because what was happening. And I started saying over and over again, something went wrong. Something went wrong. And it was right around that time frame that when the one was looking me directly in the eyes, all of a sudden, uh, the best way to kind of describe it is almost like a hive effect where I was looking at his eyes, but I all of a sudden I felt everything around me, like almost this huge expansive universe. And when I think back when I'm thinking, was that experience real? Was it made up in my mind? But I had that tremendous feeling like I could reach out. And I don't want to say it panicked, but I sensed in its mind that something went wrong, that I was not that was not supposed to happen with me. And it kept trying to stop me from seeing inside of its mind. And you have to think about the mind of a 12 or 13 year old kid. And for some reason, I, I best way to describe it is like it was like a role reversal. Like they'd had me a number of times and now I felt like I was in control for the first time. And every time it tried to stop me from seeing its mind, I kept doing everything I could to keep seeing there what was going on. And I just wonder back now if maybe that's why I have sensations because maybe there was a connection. Hmm. And that when I'm around some of these events, like when I was down at the Salt Fork State Park, when I had sensations, that maybe there's some connection going back. I don't know. I can't explain it. And I've had that same feeling several other times on several investigations I've done. Uh, we've gone back uh, and done, what, three regressions now. And I should call the... Um, the person up to see if we can do another because the last time we got to a point that uh, I think she was getting a little bit concerned because of the way I was responding body wise my all my reactions the heart rate everything else and she goes I don't know what happened but she goes something has set up an extremely strong block that doesn't want us to go past uh, again it sounds like something out of a movie but that's what it, the way she felt uh, we've explored a couple other time frames around that, the same incidents on here going back even farther to the first time. And the first time that, um, I had memories along those lines was out of my grandmother's farm one night when I was probably maybe only about, I don't know, maybe about eight, 10 years old, something like that. And, uh, I felt something was watching me through the window. Now, it could be a child's paranoia of something, you know, feeling like something is looking at you. But I felt something was. And on her farm, I mean, to give you an idea, it was kind of in a rural area. They didn't even have indoor plumbing. They had an outhouse outside. And it got really breezy in the wintertime when he went out, <laughs> out there. That was for sure. <laughs> and on one occasion uh, during the summer, I mean, we're out there. And, what I mean, what can you do on a basically a, a rural farmhouse like that? I mean, there's nothing out there other than the house, which is a one-bedroom house, an outhouse, and a woods. So once in a while, I go down to the woods and explore because my grandfather drug some old Model Ts down there at some point, abandoned them. And I would just kind of go down there, look at the old cars, kind of roam through the woods. And on one, the first occasion, I remembered being in the woods and I felt something was coming towards me. And I started heading towards an area where there was a pond at just outside of the woods. And I heard almost like the rustling of footsteps behind me. Uh, I didn't see any animals at that bit prior to that. And I, no matter how hard I tried to turn, I could not turn around to look at what was behind me. And I would start trying to go off to, to maybe off a little bit to my right and the footsteps would get on my right hand side and I would start going back to my left just to get away from the footsteps. When I go back too far to the left, the footsteps would be on that side of me. I would end up going back towards the right, almost like I was being herded. And I remembered going back towards that pond area, which is kind of in a little recess that you couldn't see from the ground. Mm. And that was where all of a sudden this block came up that I couldn't go any farther. Um, 
on another occasion. I mean, I just couldn't remember any more past that point. But that was the earliest experience I had. But who knows how many of them I may have had along those time frames because I went through a situation where um, I started developing ulcers so bad as basically like an 11-year-old kid um, that eventually at the point I became 15, they became so bad. They were bleeding so profusely. Even if medications they used on special diets they had me on for four years, I almost died, according to the doctor. He said he remembered doing the surgery. He says, you were in such bad shape medically at that time. Uh, from ulcers, which he couldn't figure out why I was that nervous to, to create that. He says, when uh, we had you on the table doing the surgery, he says, you're about two weeks away from dying. Mm. Yeah. And then um, after that, the last experiences I could remember back then were probably when I was maybe like 17, 18. But I remember getting so paranoid uh, uh, when we lived in South Carolina, I had curtains up, but I would take sheets and literally wrap them around the edge of the curtains so no light, no nothing could come into the room. I don't know how many times I'd get up at night checking everything out because I felt something was coming almost nightly. It was just an extreme paranoia. Other than that, I just had the normal childhood. Other than that, huh? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, you know, other than aliens potentially coming around, abducting you, doing all sorts of things to me. You know, I felt like I had a pretty normal childhood uh, overall. Well, you know, I, I have a question I want to throw out to uh, uh, to everybody here uh, uh, this evening. Do you think that we've actually been chosen to do this work? I mean, some people talk about oh, you know, being reincarnated to here <clears throat> and then knowing what our task will be. I, I don't know if I want to go that far with this, but do you think that there's some energy, some force, so, something out there that's pushing us to do uh, this kind of research and, and work and uh, and all? Because we've all stuck at it for so long against insurmountable odds, I would say. I, I think so, Tim, because that's why I feel like I was drawn back to it. I, I kind of call it like a moth being drawn back to a flame. And that flame, in this case, is an alien, you know, or something like that some extraterrestrial presence. Uh, that early experience just keeps drawing us right back to it all the time. And I got well, to the point that I was almost like going crazy, you know? Well, I always have a, a memory that, that still sticks in my mind, and that was being a child in a crib, and I can see my parents in the room, and there is a, uh, a skeleton well, I'm looking at the head. To me, it's a it was a skeleton, and to me, it was a real event, and it was very vivid. And I remember being picked up out of the bed, and I had to squint my eyes. I didn't really want to look at it, but I wanted to see what was going on. I remember seeing the, the you know the light colored face. It looked like a skull to me with the dark so eye sockets. And then the next thing I know, I wake up and. My head is where my feet should be, and I'm really in a panic because I just remember this, and now it's it's daylight, you know, it's morning. The sun's come up, and I'm freaking out because I'm I'm stuck uh, where my feet should have been down, you know, at the bottom of the bed. And for longest there, I thought that was a real event. Till finally one day, I realized as I got older, that can't really happen. That was skeletons don't walk around your bedroom at night, mm. but I. I was looking at, um, as I got interested in aliens and stuff, one day I got to looking at, a, uh, you know, thinking about some of the sketches of greys and stuff and how uh, someone recently described to me having an experience where they thought it was a, a skull coming toward them and then it got real close and they realized, oh, it's a grey. So I'm, you know, I'm, I kind of wonder because I, I don't know really where my obsession came from. My father thought that, Maybe I picked it up from him because back in the 50s, he remembered seeing uh, some a central object with lights swarming around it. The newspaper the next day, the FAA said it was uh, just a refueling operation, but he said it looked really weird. It didn't seem to go down to the horizon. It just seemed to sort of go further out into the sky and disappear that way. And uh, my mother used to tell a story about seeing something with windows in it that came down by the, the family garden. So, you wonder. <laughs> and and, and hey, you, Tim, there in, in Indiana? Well, uh, 
ra- rather than rather than uh, me saying something, Tim, uh, we we got a question from uh, Trevor in oh. Texas, and I want to uh-huh. get to this before we run out of time. So Trevor Absolutely. wants to know it, and this is for everybody. What do you think is the most significant change in ufology that you've seen uh, over the past forty years? The internet. Yeah, the internet's changed mm-hmm. a lot. Of- yeah, the internet and then the um, the tools that we've got available to us now to do investigations. You think back when you got into this, Tim, but, I mean, everything was being done by phone, calling people, meeting them direct to direct, direct face to face. Now we can do so much research right off the internet and computers. I don't know. I kind of like that face to face. Yeah, well, I like the non. Yeah, I like the nonverbal communication you get by being face to face, but. Uh, really what I'm looking at is like, okay, you can check out flight patterns. You can check out weather oh, yeah. conditions. You can yeah. do so much mm-hmm. research, um, astronomy, you can do so much research that way, but you do need that face to face without a doubt. I agree with that. Well, and, and information, I mean, you're able to gain access to all kinds of information from all over the planet in, uh, just a rapid amount of time. I mean, you, you have something that, uh, of significance that happened in Japan, you know, you can find out about it in, you know, uh, minutes even after it happened. And with Skype, you can actually connect with people overseas and, and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, do all these things that you couldn't before. I remember yeah. being... I remember being poor growing up and going, you know, my father didn't want me to, you know, uh, make long distance calls on the home phone. So I'd, we'd be out at a shopping mart and I would uh, have all these coins and I'd go to a, a pay phone and uh, call somebody out in Minnesota that I read about in a magazine. You know? Well, that, that, I, that, that was you that probably was putting in there. Well, I remember we used to do that with Rick Hilberg and all, too. And they, a couple of the guys would put the coins in the, the phone. Uh, you know, <laughs> the <laughs> and then of course we we would send we would send um, well it wasn't even cassette tapes but we would send uh, uh, tapes around to each other you know we'd start out uh, with giving a ten minute uh, spiel and then sending it to Alan Greenfield and Alan Greenfield <clears throat> would hold on to it add his two cents worth and send it to um, to to somebody else you know we're coming to the end of the show I I just uh, realized that we've got. Uh, yep, probably three, three minutes, minutes and yeah. counting. And I want to give yeah. you guys the opportunity to uh, push and promote your activities and your books. And uh, Brent, start out. Well, what's new with you? What? Uh, where can people get your fine publication that I've been reading for many, many years, uh, al- uh, Alternative Perceptions? Uh, I, I was buying it when it was a printed magazine, and I wish it still was, to be honest with you. But well, I, that was nice. <laughs> that was nice. It was, you know, color cover at the end and 58 pages. But we went to the internet. We're at apmagazine.info. We come out monthly now. In fact, we're out to issue number, the March issue is number 216. And we're still going strong. What what great material. If you want to uh, read about uh, some of the, the paranormal aspects of, uh, of this and interviews with the researchers, some of whom I've never even heard of, but it's some great material. It's a really, really good publication, and the price is right. It costs, doesn't cost you a dime, which is a That's shame, right. actually, because it's worth a heck of a, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's weight in gold. And, and Tom, you take it away. Okay, uh, if you want to come to the Cleveland Ufology Project meetings, we meet every month, the third Saturday of every month at Co- uh, Community College in Cleveland, Ohio. If you go to clevelandufo.com, you can find our meeting schedule. And this weekend, this Sunday, as a matter of fact, we've got a meeting of the MUFON of Ohio down at Westerville Library in Columbus. Uh, you can go to the MUFON Ohio website and find that. And we've got our conference coming up this year on June 18th featuring, featuring Peter Robbins, Jen Stein, and Bill Konkoleski, who's also an experiencer on there. Uh, oh. So that's coming up. I think it's going to be a great conference. How, how many people do you expect for that, uh, something like that? I'm, I'm looking at hopefully this year about 150. At least. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There you go. Well, that'll be a good... Well, Cleveland always was a hub of UFO uh, activity. I mean, it just... Uh, there were... I, I've seen photographs, like when George Adamski was in town. Must have been 800 people in the auditorium. Well, I want to wish you all a good evening, and thank you for being on with us and sharing some fascinating stories. I, I mean, this is with some great, really, really great material. 
And uh, Tim will uh, be tuning in uh, next week and we'll have some other uh, guests on. I'm lining up people now for the next uh, two or three weeks. And uh, we've got some really interesting shows coming up. Not all UFOs. I mean, I don't want our audience just to think we're flying saucers out there. You've been listening to Exploring the Bazaar with hosts Timothy Beckley and Tim Swartz. They're taking back the night by jetting non-stop across the cosmos in search of the truly bizarre and totally unexplained with you as their co pilot Thursday nights at 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. For more information on exploring the bazaar and hosts Timothy Beckley and Tim Swartz, check out their KCOR Digital Radio Network page. Follow their YouTube channel at MRUFO1100. Exploring the bazaar.